So the last circle of your life that you might want to self-advocate in or you might need to is the big one, and this is institutions and organizations and society. So we have Autism Speaks, and from now, now I'm sure that you have an idea of, of the harm that they're doing to the autistic community by spreading this negativity, this message of hopelessness, and then also this misinformation that mostly boys have autism, that most people with autism are nonverbal, when actually two out of ten autistic people will never speak. That's the minority. So, you know, Autism Speaks isn't great, but what can we do about it? You can self-advocate with other self-advocates, and in this way, you can raise your voices and generate change in society. And this can look like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Right. Their slogan is, nothing about us without us. They were founded by Eric Heyman. <coughs> they are focused on autistics, providing information and research and services for autistic people and their families. So it's not a bunch of non-autistic people, like on the board of Autism Speaks, they don't have one autistic person on their board. It's autistic people who, who know first time what it's like to be autistic and who want to change society to be more accepting and more accommodating of all people with disabilities, but you know, particularly those with autism is their special focus, <laughs> their special interest. <laughs> And, uh, and so that's a way that you can advocate for yourself amongst society is saying no to organizations like Autism Speaks. Uh, if you're interested, in July there is a boycott Autism Speaks Twitter hashtag kind of explosion happening and those are things that seem small but when people start boycotting the corporate sponsors of Autism Speaks and saying no, Autism Speaks doesn't speak for me, I'm not a tragedy, I'm not a burden, when you start saying no to Autism Speaks Corporate sponsors have started to withdraw their sponsorship of Autism Speaks. And you know, this year they didn't have as much money to fund their trips to the Barbados for the CEOs. So people are starting to learn that, you know, So it's crippling the economy. Yes, you know, a, a way to advocate is to hit Autism Speaks where it hurts, which is their pockets. They make so many millions of dollars a year and they spend so little bit on autistic people. Boycott Autism Speaks corporate sponsors is a way. Another way is to write to politicians in your area, like your MP. If you see a problem with how the Canadian government is talking about autistic people, which I often do, um, write to them and say, hi, I'm autistic and I have concerns about the way that, that you're making it sound like all autistic people are burdens to their families. You know, we don't need to combat autism. Yeah? You're aware that there's a um, new Vancouver brand to the Autism South Avenue Network? Yes, that's And the going first to meeting is on the 18th. Okay. Yeah, 18th is Autistic Pride Day, which is for autistic people to be loud and be proud. There's a lot on the internet about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the 18th, July 18th, and uh, the Autistic Self Advocacy Network Vancouver chapter is opening for their first meeting, which is just a casual meet and greet. Yes. So if you want to write that down, ask them, and then July they have, 18th. They have a meetup site, they have a website, yeah. and I've already connected with a woman, and I'm very connected with her. We have a lot of ideas. Yeah. Uh, does that last one include the medical, like a healthcare mm -hmm. system? People stood up, even though a well, and today you're not going to be shot probably, but shot for having um, being having autism, like Harvey Milk was shot for being gay. But it's kind of the same oh, yeah. idea. If you stand up like okay. he did, you're going to make a change. He made significant change in that it's, community. Yeah. It's a similar rights movement. Yes. Just no matter who you are, you're a person, and you deserve to have rights and to exist in your society. When you use that, you shot. But I don't get shot. Today. Yeah. I would like to say that uh, inspiration. Oh. Um, I have, I honor you, all my respect to you. Keep the good work. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow, I'm blushing a little now. <laughs> Thanks, that's very sweet. Um, I appreciate that a lot. And, and then, uh, so we have institutional organizations like Autism Speaks and ASAN. You can say no to Autism Speaks and add your voice to ASAN. And then we have institutions like the medical system in our society. Ways that you can advocate for yourself there are, are very similar to the ways that you advocate for yourself in an employment setting. Sadly, okay, I, I have a chronic illness and some other things going on as well as being autistic. So I've seen a lot of doctors in my day. And one doctor I've ever seen out of all the probably dozen doctors I've seen, many specialists, a neurologist, two neurologists, knew very little about autism, one doctor knew something about autism. 
And, and when one in a hundred people are autistic, you know, it's, it's something that you should probably at least have a minimal knowledge of. But a lot of doctors don't. So what I've found that I have to do, which is a little bit disheartening sometimes, but you do what you gotta do to survive, right? Is actually coming with a brief explanation of autism. Coming with a brief explanation of sensory processing disorder. And then you can present that to your doctor because I found that it's impossible, or very hard at least, to get medical care, especially mental health care that you need, when people don't know that you're autistic or they don't know what autism is. There's been situations where my sensory processing disorder was misinterpreted as depression or as anxiety, when that's not the case. There's been times where people have misinterpreted my autistic traits of having trouble making eye contact or speaking verbally with other things going on or mental illnesses, or they just dismiss my physical symptoms because they assume I have anxiety because, you know, I apparently I come off as quirky or something, you know, something's not quite right there. So the way that you can advocate for yourself in an institution setting like in the Canadian Health Institution is by educating the professionals. Which is the scary part if you think about it. It totally is. And it it can be scary and if and there's always a risk that a doctor will be pish posh. My old doctor said, I'm pretty sure kids have autism. So <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get get very far there. And so when I, I moved cities, I made sure that I found a doctor and that I came out right away as autistic. And when I saw that he, if he didn't at least have a very thorough understanding of it, he was willing to research it and willing to look it up, I knew I'd found a doctor to stick with. Because one of your rights in the institution of the health system is you get to pick your doctor. Like, I mean, again, it can be hard and you might want a little help on this front, but when it comes to somebody who you're working with intimately to make sure that you're healthy and happy and safe, you want to have somebody that you know you can trust. And so if you feel like you're not safe with your doctor or if you come to them with information and they keep dismissing you, then it might be time to find another doctor. and if and if you are on the internet, a great site called RateMD, you can see of other people with autism who have had experiences with doctors. And then amongst the autistic community, we also tend to trade stories of specialists and doctors and see if we can find one that will work for us. So in this way, it's great to have community connections. But the most important thing is to remember that you have a choice in who your healthcare professional is and that it's totally okay. And they should be accepting of you bringing information forward and helping them to understand you, educating them a bit on autism, which again is kind of a little ridiculous or frightening that you would have to educate the healthcare professionals on a disorder that's in one in a hundred people, but that's where we are in a society. And by doing these small steps for you today, you create these ripples through society and more and more doctors will be aware of autism. I know I did that for myself when I got a new doctor when I lived here. I brought in all my tests and stuff, and I said, here, she's like, what's this? I said, kind of a very brief overview of who I am, and you may want to put it on my medical file. That's perfect. That's so great. <laughs> she's like, oh, okay. And that's exactly what she did at it, and because the paperwork I've had to have filled out for ministry and stuff, she loves it, because all she has to do is go with my file, pull it out, and go find the answer she needs so far. That's awesome. So, okay, just to conclude this part about advocating for yourself in society, I have some pictures of autistic advocates doing their thing. This is Melanie Yergo of Aspie Retor. Did I say it Retor? I think so, yeah. yeah. She is strongly against the puzzle piece symbol, which of course is Autism Speak symbol, largely in part because she's against Autism Speak, but also because she and many other people in the autistic community believe that people shouldn't be reduced to a puzzle and that autism isn't puzzling when you ask autistic people. And a lot of parents use the puzzle piece symbol to kind of mean, you know, we won't stop until our child has no missing pieces or until every piece fits. But we aren't jigsaw puzzles missing pieces. We're autistic and we have our impairments, but we're not, we're not puzzle pieces with missing pieces. We have no missing pieces. Oh All our pieces are here. I like one, one. the puzzle because that's how to describe my life exactly. It was a puzzle. And Not knowing when it was until two months I graduated from UBC. Two months before my graduation hit my diagnosis of Asperger's. Congratulations. 
Thank you. I wish I would have come sooner for both of us. But yeah, I know, but you know now. what? I may not have gotten that far out of it. So I'm actually glad I got it when I did. Right. And so it's okay if you like the puzzle piece. That's totally cool. But there are many autistic people in the autistic community who <coughs> prefer not to use the puzzle piece and prefer instead to use the rainbow infinity symbol of neurodiversity. Actually, there's a new one. It's, um, have you heard of AU? Oh yeah, community. the autism gold. Yeah, or yeah, it's the gold AU. Normal. Although you gotta be careful. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> okay, this is um, Lydia Brown of Autistic Koya. This is kind of, I mean, it's a happy picture because she's out there, but it's kind of sad because this was at the Washington Memorial for autistic and developmentally disabled people who were murdered by their family and caretakers. The list is tragically long. Um, actually. Uh, can I take a moment of silence for Robbie Robson? Were they in the institution or something? Um, some of them were, but many of them were at home. But um, So if we could just have a moment of silence for Robbie Robson, I'll tell you when it's over. So it's really tragic that we live in a world where every year we list the names of the dead and every year it gets longer. Like this is why even the smallest voice, like do you just advocating for yourself amongst your friends, your family, it changes the public perception of autism and it moves society towards a place of acceptance. Not of this place of fear where the cure culture has brought us, but to a place of realizing that every brain is different and that just because you have a parent doesn't mean that your life isn't worth living. None of us are better off dead. So, what, what really aggravated me the most about this story about the, is they, the way that they, the media described like, oh well, his mom had no choice. She like had no other option, and they and they didn't make it like seem like she was mentally ill. They made it seem like the autism drove her to it. Like, oh, you'll just be driven to it. Sadly, like, that is often the case when, especially mothers, murder their autistic children. It is always phrased in a way that the autistic person drove them to do it, or that you know this in particular, Robbie Robson. The story is kept talking about how, his, how small his mom was and how big he was. And you know, this is clearly to make the public think of Robbie Robson as this big, violent person, you know, who, oh, clearly she had no other choice. It's quite sad that mothers who commit murder um, when their children are disabled, cerebral palsy or autism or Down syndrome, they consistently get way lighter sentences if they get any jail time at all. It's often four or six months. It's like the guy that gassed their kid, their kid in the car, and then he's like, oh, well, she, she would be better off, you know. There's often comments on these news articles, don't judge until you've been in their position, and, oh, it's probably for the best now, at least he's not in pain now. But the thing is that nobody would be commenting on this. Nobody would be playing devil's advocate if it were a non-disabled child. And their mother yeah, killed everybody them. society would be checked off that a mother killed her child. So, you know, it's, it's tragic, and it's, again, this misunderstanding of, what autism is, what autistic people's lives are like. And this idea, thanks to cure culture and the medical model of disability, that we're not full people, you know? And and so it's amazing people like Lydia Brown who are standing up and saying, no, 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 it is never okay. Violence is never okay, and no person should ever be murdered. It doesn't matter what their neurotype is, it doesn't matter how hard their life was, nobody deserves that. Talk about suicide or? Uh, Parents and caretakers who murder autistic children. Assisted suicide is a whole different issue. That's a whole different. And this is Joe of the Slithery D and two friends. This is a funny story of this picture. Autism Speaks is having one of their galas. And you know, this is where upper middle class people go and they wear blue jewelry and get blue manicures and they eat expensive dinners and they talk about how sad it is that people have autism and they give a little bit of money and then they leave for the night. And a lot of these people, their heart's in the right place. They just don't know because, again, the loudest voice talking about autism is Autism Speaks, and these are non autistic people who have their own agenda. Joe and her two friends were outside protesting, and there was a fancy photographer there, like a professional photographer to take pictures of everybody's dresses and the food and the blue balloons. And he snapped a few shots of Joe and her, and her friends, and then Autism Speaks uploaded them to Facebook. Oops. This was in the album with all the pictures of like the, the blue lights and the blue balloons and the people in their fancy dresses and tuxes. So that's actually on the Autism Speaks Facebook page right now and they don't seem to have noticed yet. So I'm just not saying anything. Don't you don't you think by us 
wouldn't it make more sense to just completely ignore Autism Speaks altogether and, and focus on what we can do and show us doing something amazing like opening up a business rather than wasting time going to these galas, making all the signs, because then it was then all you're doing is really you're giving them you're telling them about Autism Speaks, you just completely ignore them altogether. They'll just completely forgotten about it and die, and trickle trickle to nothing instead of just keep reminding about how bad they are. When it comes to things like you know, buying blue light bulbs at Home Depot and the money goes to Autism Speaks, or when it comes to corporate well, just do sponsors the of do, Autism do Speaks. Do Light Up instead. Do that instead. Promote I, that 100%, and then they'll just completely forget about the gold, the blue. Blue will just be forgotten. Don't, think, don't tell them how bad it is. Just be reminding them about the, the, the organization. I think that, you know, when it comes to corporate sponsors of Autism Speaks or giving money, it's definitely best to ignore them in yeah. that setting. But I think that if society doesn't, you know, if the autistic community doesn't hadn't spoken up so far, we wouldn't have gotten to this point where there is lighted up gold. Many of us would, you, you know, I mean, I can talk with my mouth parts, but without organizations like the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and there are yeah, there are lots of autistic people who never would have gone to AAC. They would never be able to communicate. They might be in institutions. So. It's very important to ignore Autism Speaks when it comes to supporting them, but when they come out with, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, their support of the Combating Autism Act in the United States, it's important for us to say no. And so I'm going to talk about that. What, what Just to conclude, oh, it's 449. I'll say this, and then we'll have a short break, and then question and answers. <clears throat> so, whoa, I talked a lot. Okay. So, in the U.S., George W. Bush signed an act into law called the Combating Autism Act in 2006. Immediately, and before this was a law, when it was just still up for voting, um, the autistic community and its allies expressed a lot of concern about the, the title of the act, Combating Autism. Because you can't separate autism and autistic people. It's not something that we have, like a dog. You know, we can't leave the dog in the other room and come in here. When you talk about combating autism, you're combating our neurotype, and so you're combating us, because we are the product of our, of our minds. Thank you. They also, the Autistic self advocacy Network and the autistic community and their allies also wanted more to be included to actually help autistic people and their families. They wanted the act to include more support and employment opportunities for autistic adults, they wanted the act to include self-advocates and research processes, and they wanted more emphasis on and comprehensive services for the underrepresented groups in the autistic community, like women and racial minorities. Sadly, the Combating Autism Act became law without the addition of any of these suggestions from the actual autistic community. The Combating Autism Act came up again to be looked at, and thanks to ASAM's amazing campaigning, the title was changed to the Autism Cares Act. No longer will the government in the United States be combating autism. But unfortunately, those same suggestions, more services and employment for autistic adults, you know, more services for autistic women and racial minorities, they were actually actively lobbied against by Autism Speaks and Autism Speaks allies. The fact that an organization that claims to help autistic people actively lobbied against, including points in a bill that would enrich and better the lives of autistic people is astounding because what they want is more focused on research. You know, that genetic test to prevent autistic people from ever being born. What they want is more fear so that they keep getting more money. And so while there was a victory there, thanks to self-advocates not only just, you know, ignoring Autism Speaks and not supporting them, but speaking up against that hate and that fear, the Combating Autism Act was reintroduced as the Autism Cares Act, but there's still a ways to go. If you're interested, you can just Google the Autism Cares Act, and there is a petition online. It's the second Google link for you to take a look at, but again, it will be on that website link on the piece of paper that I handed out. And so there are things that you can even do from the comfort of your own home to <laughs> bring society towards a place of acceptance and of understanding. And and neurodiversity for all because everyone's brains are different and they are all great.